I'm Heidi Zuckerman. I've spent my life connecting people to art to make their lives better. This podcast talks about art in contemporary culture and why we should care. Each episode is an impactful conversation with people I find interesting and think you will too about their life, values, and always about why they think art matters. This is Conversations About Art. Garrett Golden is the founder and CEO of Hint Inc., the San Francisco-based healthy lifestyle company best known for Hint Water and most recently Hint Sunscreen. Kara is an operating entrepreneur and has grown Hint into a brand worth hundreds of millions of dollars. In this episode, we talked about how our skin is our largest organ, products that solve problems, the productive aspects of anger, her art educator mom, and happiness as both a business and personal guiding practice. Well, I think for me, you know, I started an unsweetened flavored water company uh, called Hint, and that really came from a place where you know, I wanted to have a product that didn't have sweeteners in it that I was hugely addicted to Diet Coke for years and, you know, never really thought that it was, you know, unhealthy. And then when I was taking a break from work and, you know, was, had had three kids at that time, I have four kids now, but I was, you know, trying to get myself in shape. And what I really quicker, quickly realized was that the diet sweeteners, um, and, and I was definitely ahead of my time, but, you know, this was a little over 15 years ago were, you know, causing me to overeat, hang on to weight. And I had never been a big person. It was, it was crazy. And so I, you know, really took a look at everything that I was eating and drinking and, and ingredients. And what shocked me was the ingredients in, uh, in the diet Coke that I was drinking. And so I gave it up, not really more as a test, more than a commitment and, uh, and recognize that what I was looking for, um, you know, was just a better tasting water. I aspired to be a water drinker, but, you know, grew up in Arizona and should have been drinking a lot more water, but I just wasn't. And so I um, started slicing up fruit and throwing it in water. And, and when I, you know, had gotten off of Diet Coke, I, I actually lost over 50 pounds in six months, which is a 50? 50, 55 pounds in six months. And I had terrible adult acne that had developed over, you know, the years. And um, I was like, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I went to all these dermatologists and, you know, didn't like, you know, want to go on Accutane or anything as I was, you know, having kids. And and so then I really, you know, now I recognize that like your skin's your largest organ and my skin was actually telling me that things were not working inside. And so when I converted from drinking diet soda over to drinking water, I, um, you know, I, I lost all this weight, my skin cleared up, my energy levels were up, but I was bored because I just wasn't a water drinker. And so I started slicing fruit and throwing it in water. And I was like, that does the trick. And then I looked for this product in like a, you know, single serve option that I could just go to the store and buy that versus the diet soda. And everything was made with fake fruit. You know, it was just flavor companies that were adding stuff. And actually at that time, it was also um, filled with some sort of sweetener, whether it was sugar or, NutraSweet or, you know, Splenda or something today at Stevia. And so, you know, I really recognized how, you know, I, I talked about overeating, like for me, it wasn't, um, you know, chewing on 10 or having 10 cupcakes a day. It was like eating candy and, you know, and sort of like just grabbing whatever I could in order to throw stuff in inside of me because I was just getting a crate, like a sweet craving. And so, um, so when I had this idea, because I couldn't find it on the shelf to develop hint, it was, um, 
you know, I always tell other entrepreneurs, like I didn't aspire to be the next Red Bull executive or, you know, founder or even Diet Coke. I mean, that was like the farthest thing. I was actually trying to solve a problem for myself. And I would have never like started this company if I was, you know, trying to mimic what other people have done, which is, you know, maybe how other people do it and maybe that works for them. But for me, it just was really, you know, about disrupting, you know, I like I was pissed that I had been, you know, drinking something that was diet and thinking that that was like healthy. And then, and how I had been sold and marketed to for so many years. And I was trying to figure out why, you know, why had I been so stupid and why had I been so fooled? And so that was kind of the first kind of epiphany for me. And then, you know, I just, I was looking for a job in tech, which is where I came from. And I thought, oh, I don't know, while I'm doing that and raising young kids and, you know, why don't I, I mean, I had three kids under the age of four, what better time to go start a company, right? And so I, um, you know, I just thought, God, it'd be pretty cool if I could, you know, get a product on the shelf at Whole Foods. And so I did. And, you know, I, I really, you know, I had a small business plan, but for me, it was, it was people always ask like, oh, did you like want to be the next vitamin water? And I'm like, no, like, I didn't even think I had a company. I, I like barely had a product. I mean, it was kind of a game for me to, you know, get it, the, get it in, you know, get it on the shelf and see if actually other consumers wanted it. And then when they did, then I just decided like, wow, I could actually give people a product that helps them. Right. And, and, you know, people ask a lot, like how, how did you know that, or what, you know, inspires you. And, and I think that consumers telling me that, that this product really helps them. Um, it can be anything from helping them drink water to helping them get off of diet soda or something like a vitamin water or um, helping them lose weight. We hear from a number of people who, you know, have been helped with hint by um, with their type two diabetes um, you know, which has grown to be like 45% of the population now has type two diabetes or pre-diabetes. And um, so again, like for me, doing a product that actually ultimately creates happiness, um, not in the sense of, you know, Coca-Cola creating happiness, but truly health happiness, right? Like every, even if you're just doing nothing, but you know, becoming aware of drinking more water, I feel like, you know, without your health, so many people have told me, no matter how, you know, wealthy you are, or your gender, or where you live, or whatever, without your health, like you, you kind of don't have happiness, right? And so I feel like just by helping people get a, you know, just a taste of, of water that just has fruit, in it with no sweeteners is, um, is doing that. I love the idea of having a company that's based around this, the notion of, of happiness. And there've been a lot of efforts, I think, towards how to have a, a happier population. And I remember studies a few years ago about how happy people are in Denmark or, how meditation can make people happy. And I have a super transformative story for myself when, and you and I are both in YPO. That's how we connected originally. Yeah. And my forum was taking the Proust test and one of the, or the Proust questionnaire rather. And one of the questions there is when in your life have you been the most happy? And I remember in my forum skipping that question and one of my forum mates saying like, okay, you can skip some of the questions. You don't have to answer all of them because there are a lot of them. But, you know, why did you skip that one? And at the time I said, well, you know, I think happiness is quixotic. It's hard to access. It's, you know, abstract. And I'm not really interested in happiness. I, I'm, I'm more interested in, in peace. And he said like, okay, you know, noted. 
And then it was only later that I realized that I was so unhappy at that time that I couldn't remember, in fact, any time that I had been happy. Of course, I had been, but you know, my circumstances in that moment didn't allow it. So now I think about being happy and having happiness, but also simultaneously having peace. Talk to me about happiness in in your life and for yourself and and maybe using that priest questionnaire of a yeah, time in your life that you've been the most happy. Yeah, I mean, I think it really goes back to the idea of helping people, right? Like I never would have defined, uh, you know, my sort of ultimate like job as like and and role as helping people to you know be happier. But when I think about you know the the needs of humanity, no matter where you're living, again, I I really think it's you know it's health. And, and I think that, that if you can actually do that through creating, you know, a product or a piece of art or service or whatever, where people, you know, really find happiness with that, I think that, you know, that's gold, right? Like that's, that's just something that's, that's incredibly powerful. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how I would really answer that. Like, I feel like, uh, I feel like I'm constantly trying to, uh, create, right. Like, I think that for me, um, I mean, even when Hint was, you know, we've continued to, to grow every year over the last 15 years. I mean, we're now the uh, largest independent non-alcoholic beverage in the country that doesn't have a relationship with Coke, Pepsi, or Dr. Pepper, Snapple. And, you know, it's like kind of crazy when I say that, like how, you know, we've been able to accomplish that and grow it. And I feel like when, like a few years ago, I had a scare uh, with skin cancer and that I started looking for a product um, after I'd had, you know, a big slice of the top of my nose removed, um, too much sun in Arizona, probably over the years and not really being serious about wearing sunscreen. And, uh, so I started looking for a product that I would really enjoy and wear. And I think that I, when I started looking for, you know, the sunscreen, I really started to think about, you know, the it has to, things that I actually um, put inside my body and put on top of my body, whether that be clothing or, you know, sunscreen or whatever, has to be a good experience. And experiences can be like, I mean, the way it feels, um, the packaging, the, uh, the smell, all of those things. And if, if one of those things is off, then it's not something that like, it, it's a complicated thing because it's like either, you know, you could have bad packaging, but then you could have the, the rest of the experience could be amazing, but you always sort of like highlight it as this is a great thing, but the packaging is really messed up or what, whatever. But I've always believed that there's different aspects of that in order to create, you know, this, this um, experience with the brand. And so Anyway, um, and then the final piece of that was if you're purchasing something that it's also priced too. And so I was very, um, you know, aware that again, I had, I had four kids and a startup and I just thought like at my, I finally found this sunscreen at my local dermatologist that was $45 a bottle, which is exactly what I wanted. But the one piece that was missing was that it didn't have a smell. And I started to, um, to sort of question like how I view great products, right. And, and the components. So of it, and I thought it's kind of got a couple of those things, decent packaging and a great sort of feel to it. Um, but it doesn't have a smell, which I really want, uh, like a good smell in the product, which is what 
our water has when you smell it people are always like oh you open it up and you know you smell apple or whatever and then the price tag i thought for people who have to wear sunscreen like me then like $45 for a bottle of sunscreen no matter how wealthy you are it seems like a lot of money i don't know like it just it seemed crazy so i i really you know started to look at it is this something I want it to be like, if I was going to create a product or buy a product, I wanted it to be affordable, which is what hint is. I mean, it's like $2 or less a bottle. So, so I think at that point I just decided I'm going to, you know, buy a bunch of ingredients and see if I can create a great sunscreen and, you know, long, crazy story. Um, but we ended up getting FDA approval like a year later on this product. And I think that, when I think about that, you know, product, I think that it brings people happiness. Like again, enough where people come and talk to me about it. It's not, you know, it's like $15 at most. It's um, so, you know, fairly affordable. It's, um, you know, it's just, it smells great. It feels great. There's like people come up to me constantly and, I'll be like on an airplane with a Hint shirt on, not even Hint sunscreen. And people will walk up to me and say, you know, I'd always been drinking your water, but oh my God, I love your sunscreen. It's, it's amazing. And so for me, it's, I think that great products also create happiness because they also create, you know, memories for people where people will tell me like, oh, I used to go to the beach and my kids used to fight with me and putting sunscreen on. And then they started using, you know, your product and not to be so focused on like, hint, like I think it can be almost anything, but when you think about, you know, products that create like happiness like that, it really, you know, it sort of is an interesting kind of dynamic to it. Um, but I don't know. I think, I think it's like, for, for me, that's, that was like a great kind of wake up call for me that I really, as a CEO, um, it's not just about actually managing the, you know, the bottom line and the aspect, like all the rest of the aspects of managing, managing lots of people and growing and all that kind of stuff. I think for me, I really, really still like the creation side um, where, and that really makes me happy. Like the, you know, the digging in the puzzle. Um, I think like that, you know, has really been amazing. And, you know, there's teams of people on our group now that really start to focus on it, but I tend to like kickstart these ideas. And, you know, since then we did a deodorant and have done all kinds of stuff, you know, since and have lots of ideas moving forward on it too. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that it's really, you know, that for me is um, always learning. That brings happiness as well. Um, and I feel like that's where I can really look at, I mean, even in the traveling examples, I feel like that's that's when I'm happiest because I don't, um, I'm not sitting static. And I think it's just, it's just discovering. I'm interested in the idea that your first product came out of being angry. And not just that, but there are different ways to be inspired. And I think anger can be super productive. And this idea of feeling that you, you were almost manipulated, right? You were yeah. told one thing and, and the truth was something yeah. different. Mm -hmm. yeah. I and think then that's a really important piece. So are there things that you're angry about now? Uh, I was talking on uh, sort of riffing on, on Twitter the other day about this, and I feel like I, was, I happened to be listening to a, a music set um, over the weekend that was a lot of Nirvana, and I was thinking about, you know, how – amazing bands through history sort of like end up, you know, coming into, you know, their prime after periods of time where, you know, 
life is a little dark and maybe it's not dark for everyone, but it, for certain people, it's a little bit dark. Right. And so in the case of Nirvana, I mean, there wasn't, there, there weren't, it, it took, I mean, I, I think Kurt Cobain, you know, said it best in, in so many, so much of the stuff that he sang, it was really, you know, about being himself and, you know, and, and, really um, being okay with yourself. Right. And I think like, that's, I, I think that what's most exciting for me about this period too, is, you know, are there artists out there right now that are creating during this time where, you know, they're losing their parents or they're, you know, is, is it a very dark time that anyone who's lived through this will remember? Right. Um, you know, I, I have many friends and, you know, who were in New York when 9-11 happened, right? And their perspective of it is probably, you know, significantly different than somebody who, you know, grew up in, you know, I don't know, Colorado on a ranch, right? Like, it's like, it's not that it was wrong. It's just a different perspective. And I think, you know, I, I appreciate that, like, where were you and where, and what were you going through? Cause I think that it's, it's a really, it creates who you are. So when you get time by yourself, which I guess is probably not that often with four kids and as the CEO of a major company, what do you like to do when you're by yourself? Uh, I, so I do actually get time, uh, every day I hike. Um, so I, you know, purposely live in Marin County, um, where my house backs up to a state park and, you know, I'm up there on the trails typically with my husband. Um, and, uh, and when my kids are home, then, you know, I'll, they'll go up there and uh, as well. And we'll go up there, uh, not every day, but I tend to, I'm able to get one or two of them at least once a week um, to go up, you know, and and on some of these hikes and, but also my dogs, I have two labs and um, you know, for me, it's like where I get like the best thinking and just, you know, no agenda and just sort of like talking and um, there's no cell service, Um, you know, a few minutes into the park, it just cuts out. Um, so, so I can't really get texts or distractions either. So, you know, I tend to go in for like a couple of hours. There's hundreds of miles of trails and, you know, similar to places where I've grown up. I mean, in Arizona, I, I, same thing. Like I just, I love nature and I think it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a huge component of, um, you know, how I, like relax. I think for me, it's, it's, uh, it's spending too much time inside is, uh, is, you know, stifling to me. I have to just get outside. And for me, it's not just about sitting outside. It's really about moving. That is exactly what I love to do also. And in Aspen, we have a term called FTH, which is from the house. Yeah. So anytime you can hike FTH, it's always an added benefit. But I also, I prefer to be outside rather than inside. And given the opportunity, I'll always choose outside over inside and find that to be super productive too. Not just not just being outside to be outside, but to, to be in motion outside. Are there other spaces for you that are similarly uh generative and in terms of ideas? Uh, You know, I tend to like, I would say being around outside of my family. Like I tend to like people who do different things. Um, You know, I, I don't, uh, I don't tend to have like a lot. I have a lot of acquaintances in the food and beverage industry, but I tend to, um, kind of form more bonds with people that are, uh, that are, you know, doing other things. Like, I feel like that's where I get my best thinking into where, um, you know, like people are 
educating me, but not intentionally educating me, you know, sort of telling me about their business and, you know, and, and that's where I just get the most, um, yeah, just the most lift out of that. Cause I feel like I always want to be learning. And so, you know, that is, uh, yeah, it's a super important piece for me, I think is where I, you know, tend to, you know, want to, want to learn, but also want to be. I feel that your messaging and your personal branding is really about not just the happiness piece, which we talked about, but I find it to be really inspiring and really positive. And I often will check in with what you're sharing on a particular day. If I want to see how you're starting your day and, and what your words of wisdom or grace or generosity are. And I wonder how you think about that role and how you, how you want to be in that space. I think for me, it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I like just, I like making other people happy. Right. And I think that it's also, I feel like that there's like a piece of me too that I don't get rattled very easily. Like I, I can't say that I'm like always calm, but I feel like that some of the perspectives that I've, you know, that I sort of put out there in the world are kind of, you know, life lessons for me that it's like this stuff will pass or, you know, you just have to, you know, stay calm along the way. And, you know, I just feel like sometimes words like that really helps, um, you know, helps me to get back to center. But I also feel like it helps other people because maybe, you know, they don't, they, they don't like think of the same things or they haven't been through the same experiences or, or whatever. And, you know, it's, I mean, I, I posted one, um, I was actually part of an article for graduates and like, and basically, you know, telling my story. And there was a few different co- quotes in this article um, that was in Forbes, but, um, and I was just participating. It was, it was somebody else actually wrote the article, but, um, but anyway, I thought it was, you know, interesting that I, you know, posted kind of what I had done, which was after graduation, when I graduated from college, it was an incredibly hard time to find a job. And I just, I don't know, like, I just didn't really pay attention. I was just kind of like, oh, okay, like, it's hard to find a job. I'm moving to New York. And, oh, and actually, before I decided to move to New York, I just decided Um, I didn't know for sure that I want to move to New York. I thought I did, but I thought, I don't know, maybe I should go to Los Angeles and a few other places first and, um, and see what those cities were like. Cause I really, I had been to Los Angeles, but I hadn't been to San Francisco and Chicago and Boston and New York. And so, um, I went to a travel agent back then, you know, we didn't have Expedia and some of the other things. And I had them price out a ticket for, um, going to all of these places and, you know, came back and it was less than $500 for a, you know, one way ticket, um, to, or to basically, or I should say multi-leg ticket, um, over the course of three weeks. And so the travel agent said, you know, you just have to give me dates. And I mean, I basically just was like, you know, let's just say three weeks and every four days or something, we'll just, you know, figure it out. And so, you know, when she came back, I actually thought it was a mistake when she came back and said it was less than $500. And I mean, I had over 90 jobs, job interviews, and I had multiple offers. And in addition to, you know, I, and I should like preface this by saying nothing was like, amazing. I mean, it was like executive assistant roles, which there's nothing wrong with executive assistant roles. But my point is, is that, you know, they were entry level roles, and they weren't interviewing on campuses. And it was like a time when everybody was saying like, things are really hard, and you're not going to get a job. And I just was like, okay, I'm going to just go do it. And, um, 
And I think like the other really important piece that was that I just learned a lot about myself because I had, you know, people always saying to me that it, it like there's, you know, as you're going along, you know, be sure to look at your calendar or do any of these things. But there was no parachute sort of saying people reminding me or people telling me, okay, here's how you need to take the subway, you know, in New York in order to get you, I had to figure the whole thing out. So I think like that was like a big moment in my life where I just, you know, had to be sure to go to bed at an early hour, you know, so that I could be fresh for tomorrow. And, and it was three weeks of that, which was amazing. So that, that I think, you know, was like another really happy time. And, you know, in my history, and I, when I added to this article, um, the number of people who wrote to me and said, like, that just, just helped me so much it was amazing. When you look back on on your life and how you got to where you are today in terms of stories like that who showed up for you as a, a guide or a mentor expected or or unexpected you know it's funny I have so many people along the way who like added to it like just kept you know kind of adding to the mixing bowl along the way there wasn't one particular person but I think that the thing for me was always like going to find somebody that I worked for that, um, or, you know, that I really, uh, that I really valued in terms of, and again, it's hard, you know, it's hard to take a job with somebody that you don't really know. Right. But you're, what, what does your gut say, right. About this person. And do you think you can learn something from them? So I I always kind of led with that through all of my roles. Like, am I, am I going to be working, you know, with somebody for somebody that I'm going to learn something from and who's going to be nice to me and all that kind of stuff. But I think like, I always have this mindset that if I'm learning and if I'm the student, then I'm going to, you know, that's going to be like an amazing, um, you know, an, an amazing experience for me. So I think that was like, I think that that was really, when I think back on it, and again, it's sort of years of like, sort of, you know, thinking about all these, all these pieces. But I think it's also, as I started to learn a lot of these, from a lot of these different people, I also feel like it was, um, you know, those people were teaching me that I, that I actually had a lot inside right? That I had the ability to do it. So rather than, you know, point to somebody saying like, and again, like there were so many people and there's still so many people. Like I think, you know, I have an advisory board and, and, you know, I have friends like you that I've met through YPO. And like, I just feel like I pick up on so many things along the way. Um, but I also feel like, for me, it's really about um, if those people are also teaching me things about what I have inside. I love that. I often have said when I'm looking to hire someone that I, I want someone who has something to prove, someone who takes some kind of fire from, from that. Do you have a similar feeling? Do you feel like you have had something to prove? Do you feel like you still have something to prove? Uh, you know, I feel like whenever I do, like I hire and I also encourage, you know, my team when they're hiring people, I used to sort of talk about it as like hire somebody who's smarter than you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's not exactly what I mean. What I really mean is somebody that you're going to learn from right? Somebody who's going to tell you like something that, that you don't really know. And that can mean, I mean, I think that I always hear the saying, like, you know, when you're, um, when you're a CEO or you're a leader or, you know, whatever the title is, you're a top athlete or, you know, whatever it is, it's lonely at the top, right? 
because people are looking at you like, oh, they're the top dog and, you know, whatever it is. And I think that what I've done to sort of keep myself engaged, um, you know, as the CEO of this company is always, you know, constantly being able to roll up your sleeves and learn, but also hire people that, you know, teach you things. So, you know, whether that's social media or how to, you know, write better or, you know, how to learn about an industry or, or whatever. Like, I, I just think that it's just such an important aspect that I, I just don't think sometimes people, you know, think about it, right? Like, you know, if you're running like a gallery, for example, you know, you think about, okay, I'm going to hire people who can do the tours or, you know, or help me curate or, or whatever. But I think it's probably the same thing, like that for the best galleries, you hire people that, you know, maybe know nothing about art, right? Or, and, but they actually know, a lot about social media or online events or, you know, or something that really helps you to, you know, build or think or, or whatever. I think that that it's such a key aspect um, of any, you know, I, I just think of, of, you know, growth in general. What opportunities do you think there are for bringing art to more people? I think there's, I think there's a lot of education that I think the biggest problem that most people have, especially when they're working is they just don't really have time, you know, to do it. And I think that the people that really appreciate their collections are ones that, you know, curate them in a way that, uh, that have meaning, right. That aren't just like, outsourcing it to a decorator. I mean, I guess you could do that, but I, but I, I also feel like it's, um, you know, it just, it has some kind of meaning. And again, like, I think, I don't know if you told me this or somebody else told me this, like you, you know, you have to think about your, your art as, are you doing it, you know, to make you happy or are you doing it as an investment? Right. Like, because that's, that could be two very different things. Right. And I think it's, um, you know, it's something that uh, that really, you know, I think about a lot, too. And, you know, as you start to build things out, it's the Andy Paykoff, who I uh, told you lives in, you know, Aspen and we were staying at his house and we do. Um, he's one of our bottlers for our product. And you know, he has this really amazing piece above his, uh, above his fireplace. And it's a bunch of, um, milk bottles, like, like plastic milk bottles. And it was turned into this like sculpture. And it's, I mean, it's this amazing thing. And I kept staring at it and I was like, you know, what is that? And I think, you know, when I asked him about it and his wife about it, like for them, It was really about um, creation and about like, you know, you can't even imagine that this piece is actually made out of, you know, a plastic, you know, jug that people just toss in the recycle bin every day. And it was made into this beautiful piece of art. And again, like it's tied to sort of what they do every day, right? They create and they're, you know, they're blowing custom bottles for people. And, And so... I think that that is like, you know, how I would probably think about there, there's a story, right? And there's an inspiration behind it and, you know, ties to sort of what, you know, they live every single day as well. But it's, um, yeah. So I think like that's, that's a interesting piece of it. One of my favorite things about art and artists is that Sometimes what they do is they take something that we have previously totally disregarded and don't see as having any sort of value, aesthetic or otherwise, and they literally transform it into something else. And it's through that process of seeing differently that there is, I think, something so productive and exciting and dynamic that can happen. Yeah. No, I totally 
it's uh, I, I believe it, you know, as well. I mean, my friend Maria, I told you about, I want, I'm going to connect you guys. Um, she, you know, she's been a friend for years. Her husband is actually a C- the CFO of our company and she's created uh, this collection that, I mean, the two of them are from Portugal. I've actually never been to Portugal, but, um, but I was in her studio and she was showing me all this art and she's, there's, you know, a, a lot of words through her art that are Portuguese that are meaningful to her. And, um, and the interesting thing is, is like, I've never been to Portugal, but I really appreciate her. And so I think, um, I'm getting one of her pieces and I think like the interesting thing for me is that that has the meanings of friendship, but it also like, I know that her pieces also come from, you know, love and, you know, also things that she loves and things that she values and things that she sees. And so I think it's like a, you know, I've wanted to get a piece of her art for a long time, but I think that, you know, it's, it'll be, it's an interesting, you know, sort of purchase for me because, you know, I'm sure people will walk in and they'll be like, oh, like, what is the Portuguese tie? But I think for me, it's also about the two of them. And, you know, they've been friends for a long time. And, you know, uh, her, you know, Julio, her husband is a major aspect of our company and he's been, you know, a board member and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like that's going to be, yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from, but I think it's a, it's a, um, it's a interesting piece of, uh, you know, decision-making that I think you just, it has to speak to you. So why do you think art matters? I think art matters because uh, it creates, um, you know, feelings, but also memories. I don't know if I actually told you about this, but when when I was growing up uh, in Arizona, my mom was, uh, she was right when I went to kindergarten, she was substitute teaching and she was like, just trying to, she hadn't worked for years. We had five kids and she wanted to, you know, get out of the house and go back to work. And she was an art history major. And so um, she decided to start this like mini course in the Scottsdale School District, which was teaching people the basics of art. And she didn't, um, she you know, like, she didn't really care about getting paid. And it, I mean, she really, for her, it was like, everybody should know what a Picasso looks like and what the backstory was. And so she would go in to, you know, schools, and I think it was typically like second, third grade. And she would just call the schools and say, is there any way that I could come in and, you know, do this and like talk about like these different art courses and, and, or these different artists. And it was interesting because I remember her saying like, it was never during the, um, the, you know, art class. It was actually during like the regular, like, you know, rest time or break time or whatever, she would come in. And uh, so she, you know, she had uh, all these different artists, you know, five different artists, Renoir and Picasso and um, Matisse. And, you know, and it was a very basic story on how to like recognize it and what their stories were. And I, I, uh, when she passed away about 10 years ago, um, it was interesting because there were a few people at the funeral who mentioned this to me, like they still like recognize art back to her stories of how she actually brought that into the school system. And, you know, that was like, that was her happiness because she, you know, as a, as a history major, I mean, she really believed that there were like, you know, five or six core Um, individuals. And, and so you think about, like, for me, storytelling is so important and aspects like that, um, you know, create, like created a lot of happiness for my mom that she felt like she was able to teach in a way that was um, very simple. And, and oftentimes people, 
you know, said like they didn't even think like that day that they were actually picking up on anything or necessarily even enjoying themselves. But then, you know, they remember still to this day what they learned, right? And so I, I think like that is such a, that that is so impactful. And that is why, you know, I, I think that that is also, you know, who I am too. Like just going back into kind of the, you know, the core of like what I like, I like the stories and, you know, and, and where they came from and, and because I feel like they have meaning and ultimately they, you know, they show strength and, and, um, you know, and they bring a lot of happiness as well and maybe sadness too along the way. But I think that they just, they really create something that is uh, memorable. Yeah. And a sense of truth. And it's, great that your mom picked up on something inadvertently or inadvertently that had I realized and became a key component of of our art outreach when I was running the Aspen Art Museum whereas if kids got art classes at all it was you know maybe once a week maybe once a month some of them as little as once a year so yeah. the way that we got into the classrooms was actually through things they had to teach anyway, through the standards. So that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And I think that that is, you know, the way that, that she got in. I mean, she was really like, she had these little books. I wish I still had one, but she, you know, would create, create these books and she would actually, you know, allow people afterwards to like take the books and, and color them and, you know, and, and really, you know, create something and then they would build on it. And so she had like this little program that was really, you know, pretty incredible. And it was never like so complicated where, you know, you, you felt like it was, um, you know, that it was intimidating in any way too. And um, these were, you know, things that, you know, she, she really felt like she would, she was great at sort of simplifying these things and, you know, sort of like talking about their stories and where they came from and, you know, and if they could do it, so could you. So like, that was like her theme and, you know, and it was just, and it was, it was interesting. I think she enjoyed the history part of it even more than actually like she taught art class for a while in schools and she just, and she didn't really love it. And then she did something totally different. She went off to, um, she wanted to work in fashion. And so she ended up working um, in the store that is no longer there called Goldwaters when, and she like became almost like a, a personal shopper before there was even sort of the official title. Like they kind of let her do whatever she wanted to do. And um, because she knew so much about kids clothing, she, um, she basically like ended up like calling people whenever certain collections were in and you couldn't even, they wouldn't even hit the floor because she would sell them before they even, you know, hit the floor. Cause she just knew what people, you know, really liked. I, love how someone can be so impactful and I love the idea of highlighting how something which starts from a, a place of um, maybe trying to be one thing right which is about bringing art to the schools can become this other thing which is about creativity and storytelling and courage and the idea that anyone can be anything. Uh huh. And I also wanted, I love that you brought up your mom because I wanted to ask you how being a mom yourself impacts how you do your job. So I love hearing about how your mom impacted the way that you think about all those things, creativity, courage, happiness, but also style, design, presentation, I know that you value all those things and I can see all those things in your company as well as in how you approach your life. So I'm wondering as like a final question, how being a mom has impacted how you do your work too. 
I think I'm always learning, right? Like I, I always tell people that, you know, probably how a lot of other people felt, but I never, nobody articulated this to me is that I never felt um, so stupid until I had my first child right? Like I, I was like intimidated by changing a diaper and, you know, was I going to do it right? And what happened if it, you know, like all of those things, right? It was like a whole new world for me had opened up. And then over the years, you know, I feel like I'm constantly learning. Like I used to think like, as your kids get older, you know, things get easier. Like, I think that that's not necessarily true anymore. It's just different right? There's right. different type of issues, right? That, that you deal with like along the way. And as you know, their lives are changing, your lives are changing too. And, and so it's like all of those components just get, you know, more complicated. But I think that there's a few things. First of all, I'm a huge believer that, you know, as a working parent, I, I, I remember feeling this way, like, you know, there was a whole group of people of, of, you know, mothers that didn't work when I was initially, um, you know, starting my company. And I think everybody's had that feeling like, you're like, should I just be staying at home? Should I be doing this? And I had always felt that staying at home was just not really fulfilling for me. I never judged other people. Um, on that, but I thought like, that's going to be really hard for me to do. And I noticed it when my 18 year old son was like, I think he was probably 11 or 12. He was watching, I think it was Sheryl Sandberg or somebody on TV talking about, um, you know, leaning in and, and he said, mom, I just realized like, like, you're a CEO, but there's not very many female CEOs that are out there. And I was like, where is he going with this whole thing? And, uh, and he was like, that's really cool. Like I've like seen you, you know, be this person for so long. So it's really like, why do you think that there aren't more? And I'm like, well, that's a really good question. And I remember walking away and thinking that you know, for years without even intentionally sort of teaching, I feel like I've been teaching, you know, my kids, all four of them in different ways that you can actually like be a working parent and be a good parent that your kids talk to you. They're like going through the process with you and, you know, and you can also learn from them, right. About things that you're doing you know, in your everyday life that is, um, you know, sort of different than what they're being told by the media or their teachers or whatever. And so I feel like I'm creating the next generation of, you know, workers and managers and spouses and parents that can actually, you know, look at our situation and say, it's okay. Thank you for sharing that. And I would concur on really everything that you said. And, and frankly, my son is one of my best collaborators in terms of ideas, new ideas for business. And I had a similar experience with my daughter where I remember, I'm sure you saw it too, an article that came out a few years ago, and it talked about the lifetime earning capacity for kids who had a working mom. And yeah. I remember talking about that at family dinner. And I don't know if I was trying to to justify my work or, um, but I just felt some kind of peace, I guess, in reading that article that, you know, I was actually doing something for them in terms of their long-term viability by by working full-time always. And, and when I shared that fact about earning capacity, my daughter who couldn't have been more than maybe 12 at the time, 11 or 12, she just looked at me and said like, yeah, duh. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's true. And I think like, that's, that's it. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, I'm sure your, your kids without you even like having sort of a sit down with them or teaching moment. I mean, they start to understand things, not just 
in the art world, but sort of in other, because they hear like what some of your friends do, like what is their role? What, you know, that I think for so many kids is like a, it's just a big mystery. Like, it's like, you know, if you're like, you know, a certain title, like, what does that mean? I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're a vice president in a company, even then that's like a, you know, that's a big deal in some companies. It's a bigger deal in sort of other companies, right? And I think that it's it's something that is, uh, I think that the more that you can sort of teach kids about, you know, that, about what you do and sort of what you think about, but also, you know, different aspects about it. I mean, you know, for my kids, I mean, they actually understand about like raising money for a business and EBITDA and, and things that were like totally foreign to me, you know, growing up. And I think that that's, um, you know, that that's like a really, that's an important piece of it. Um, but I also think it teaches them to, to, you know, know to like work hard and be kind and, you know, and communicate and all of those aspects are really important too. And how to navigate personal relationships and how to navigate business relationships and how to be in integrity and show up the way that you want to. And, and to also understand that things go wrong and that failure is a part of life and that you can recover from things that are unexpected or um, sometimes things that you didn't want to have happen and then happened and then see that that was actually a really great thing. So yeah. no, just, totally. you know, it's the, huge. the adaptive abilities of our kids, I think, are, are greatly enhanced by having a, a first row seat to uh, building businesses. Totally agree. Conversations About Art is part of HiZ.Art, a multi-platform project that connects all to art through a podcast series, books, talks program, brand collaborations, TV, and more. This episode was produced by Simon Illa. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Blake Migden assists with social media content editing. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We will be back again every Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks so much for listening.